Welcome to a short video going through the, your Paper 1 revision for the topic Infection and Response. You will need to learn about four different types of microbes that cause disease. So that will be uh, bacteria, viruses, protists and fungi. You're expected to know what they are and how they make you feel ill and also what they then do um, to your body. Um, so you will need to know a bit about their structures as well. So you would have learnt in cell biology about bacteria and viruses, protists and fungi uh, not so much but you, you need to know how they cause disease. In the spec they, they mention um, particular diseases that you need to understand what the symptoms are and how they are spread and whether it's spread by bacteria, virus or fungi or protist. So as you can see there's the list, so we've got salmonella, gonorrhea for bacteria We've got measles, HIV and tobacco mosaic virus, which is a plant virus um, caused by viruses. And then the fi uh, final two, rose black spot, which is caused by fungi. I would also probably learn about athlete's foot in humans. And also uh, the protest is malaria. A suggestion for your revision, I probably would get some um, cards set up, so... Um, maybe get a small set of uh, cards ready where you can put the disease, the symptoms and what it's spread by and what causes it and then test yourself or test with another friend. A popular question that examiners will ask you is what is a pathogen? And you need to mention that it, that it is a microorganism that causes infectious disease such as bacteria or viruses or fungi or protists and can be spread by direct contact by water or by air. So um, when you think about these diseases you also need to know how they are spread. So for example salmonella is going to be spread by direct contact from eating contaminated food or if it's by um, the air for example uh, rose black spot is a fungus that is spread by uh, the wind. You will need to know how your body's defence systems protect you from disease. And the first thing, uh, particularly if you're doing foundation tier, uh, they particularly like looking at the what we call non-specific defence systems. So really, all this includes is things like skin, okay which prevents entry, um, it's a barrier. Uh, the nose, okay, it's not actually on there, but you've got nose hairs uh, that physically stop um, particles getting into your body. You've also got your trachea, all right, and in your trachea and bronchi, you've got mucus linings which can trap dirt and microbes. 
and uh, your stomach and your stomach contains stomach acid which has a low pH so it's acidic so it kills harmful bacteria. There are others as you can see things like saliva and also about uh, what they call uh, good gut bacteria but uh, those are the four main things so I'll go through that again so four main things you need to know is the skin the nose hairs the mucus lining and the windpipe trachea and the stomach acid so once um, pathogens uh, get inside your body uh, they'll meet your second line of defense and in this case it is the white blood cells of your immune system um, and the immune system will try to destroy the pathogens that enter the body in several ways so the first method is by ingesting or engulfing microbes so as you can see the bacteria in this case here is being engulfed by the white blood cell here and they ingest, they take in the pathogens and they digest and destroy them and they use enzymes to destroy them. And It's definitely worth uh, learning that when they ingest, engulf and ingest microbes it, this is known as phagocytosis. So if this, is, this is a real key word that I would learn because you can just mention it one, just in your exam um, if they ask you how do white blood cells um, destroy pathogens inside the body you can mention phagocytosis and you'll get a mark. The other way is by producing antibodies um, so you can see that uh, antibodies are produced by some white blood cells and they fix onto the uh, bacteria um, and they're called antigens attached to antigens and then they stick them together and this kills the bacteria last one is producing antitoxins, so antitox antitoxins, they counter counteract or cancel out the toxins released by pathogens, particularly bacteria. The next section is about vaccinations, so how they prevent illness in an individual and how the spread of pathogens can be reduced by immunising a large proportion of the population. Here is a key word, okay, so a key word is vaccination and I'd like you to learn that please. So it involves introducing a small quantity of dead or inactive forms of a pathogen into the body to stimulate the white blood cells to produce antibodies. Usually the vaccination is given by an injection and as you can see it's injected into the body and this stimulates the white blood cells into making the particular or specific antibodies that destroy the antigens without any risk of you getting the disease. So when you, when you do come across the, um, the pathogen uh, your white blood cells can respond rapidly and it produces the correct antibody as if you had already had the disease. So this gives you what we call immunity. Following a vaccination, a person can become immune to the specific disease. This immunity gives protection against illness in an individual. Now, obviously in a, in a population, the majority of people need to be vaccinated to reduce the chance of somebody getting the specific pathogen. And this leads to herd immunity. And as you can see by this diagram, Okay, so you've got three cases here. So the first case we're going to look at is here. So in this case, no one is vaccinated. So the contagious disease spreads through the population. Second case, where some of the population uh, has been vaccinated. So you can see the green people here, they've been vaccinated. Um, contagious disease still spreads through some of the population. But if most are vaccinated then it is contained so it doesn't spread anymore and if you can contain the specific pathogen and the specific disease then you have what we call herd immunity. To treat um, other diseases such as bacterial diseases you may use antibiotics but also you'll need to know about uh, painkillers. So painkillers, they are chemicals that relieve the symptoms but do not kill the pathogen. 
Um, so you need to know common examples include paracetamol and aspirin, and they relieve the symptoms of the disease. So, for example, they might relieve a headache or a sore throat or a stuffy nose. Whereas they are um, chemicals that slow down or stop the growth of bacteria. They only cure certain types of bacterial diseases and they definitely do not, and I'll say it again, do not cure viral diseases. Um, examples include penicillin and amoxicillin and you should know about penicillin and the discovery in 1928 by Alexander Fleming. He discovered uh, the naturally occurring, occurring penicillium mould, which is a fungus, um, and that was the first antibiotic. At this stage, it might be worthwhile going through your notes from cell biology, because you would have done a, if you do GCSE biology, you would have done a required practical related to um, looking at uh, bacteria and calculating their kind of cross-sectional area um, of colonies using pi r squared okay so that was looking at inhibition zone so it might well worth uh, will be well worth your while looking at those notes again antibiotics can also um, sometimes not work due to the pathogen the bacterial pathogen becoming resistant now, um, resistance is a natural process in terms of um, bacteria exist and they, when they uh, replicate by binary fission, they will uh, produce copies of themselves and sometimes that genetic material will be mutated. And that mutation gives them an advantage, so that gives them um, resistance to the particular um, antibiotic. And then, therefore, when the antibiotic is used, they will survive and then they will um, multiply and they will thrive. So over time, um, they have become less effective due to three main factors. One is the overuse of antibiotics. So uh, in the past, people would say that they felt ill and they'd go to the doctors. And even though the patient might have had a viral infection, such as a common cold, antibiotics were were given which is not effective and wouldn't work. Second is the failing to complete the course so that means that the patients are prescribed antibiotics but they start to feel better and when they start to feel better um, they stop taking the treatment. The problem with that is that there might still be some bacteria um, in the system and these subsequently will mutate and produce resistant strains. So uh, you need to be aware that um, this causes resistance because then the surviving resistant bacteria reproduce and the resistance spreads. The third, third one is use of antibiotics in farming. Um, so previously antibiotics were regularly used in farming um, to keep animals um, well and away from bacterial diseases. And this may have... Um, meant that there would be a spread of antibiotic resistance from animals into human hosts. These days though, particularly in the UK, legal controls are now in place to try and reduce the antibiotics being used in this way. So to reduce antibiotic resistance, um, there are several things you can do and obviously only take the antibiotic when necessary, so when you're actually ill with a particular bacterial disease. You treat the specific bacteria with specific antibiotics that are designed for that particular um, pathogen. Um, another problem was antibiotic resistance occurred a lot in hospitals. Um, this is because of the conditions that, they, that, that, that people are in. Um, obviously they're quite ill as well and there's lots of antibiotics being used for ill people. Uh, but one way that uh, they improve this is through better hospital hygiene. So this includes regular hand washing by both staff and visitors. And patients who are infected with uh, resistant bacterial strains uh, should be isolated from other patients so that it doesn't spread. 
The next section covers the discovery and development of drugs. So we need to look at um, the testing of drugs and how do we, how do scientists develop new drugs. First thing is uh, to note that uh, the vast majority of drugs um, are extracted or were extracted from plants and from microorganisms. So here we have three examples. So uh, digitalis uh, is a drug which comes from the foxglove and it treats um, heart. Uh, it's a heart drug. Uh, aspirin um, used to originate from the willow tree and again that's a painkiller and then thirdly the one that you will know about discovered by Alexander Fleming was penicillium mould um, which was the first antibiotic penicillin. Nowadays most new drugs are synthesised by chemists in the pharmaceutical industry for example at AstraZeneca. However um, this starting point could be um, chemicals extracted from plants and this is a really good reason why we should protect um, plants um, around the world because some of those could be um, future um, chemicals that we use to cure diseases. Before any new drugs are taken they have to be tested for um, a range of things. First key thing is toxicity, in other words is it going to be safe, is it not too toxic or cause unacceptable side effects when it's taken by a human. Secondly is what we call efficacy, um, so again does it actually prevent or cure the disease that it's designed to um, cure. And thirdly, you need to think about the dose. So how much um, needs to be taken? What happens to that uh, chemical when you uh, excrete it? Um, and you need to know um, how your body deals with a particular dose. The three main stages of drug testing. So you've got preclinical trials. So preclinical is before humans. So that's human cells and tissues. Um, and also includes animal trials as well. So drug is tested on at least two animals to find efficacy and toxicity and the correct dosage. Saying that, a lot of the pharmaceutical industry are looking at alternatives to using animals. Um, thirdly is clinical trials. So we'll talk a bit more about clinical trials in a minute because that, that's quite a popular subject for um, the exam. So uh, the first clinical trials will involve healthy volunteers. Um, so they will test very low doses of the drug um, and it will be done in scientific conditions. So um, the key thing that they will use is that they will do what we call a double blind trial. So here the patients or, or the volunteers are either given what we call a placebo. So the placebo is a tablet that does not contain the drug or new medicine. It will contain a different drug that's already used to treat the disease. So it will look exactly the same. So the patient is given a placebo or the drug. Neither the doctor giving the drug or the patients who are getting the drug know who's received the real drug or placebo. The reason for that is that uh, you are reducing bias, okay, so uh, you don't want uh, patients thinking that they have the new fantastic new drug and they suddenly feel better. Also the doctors involved, they need to be as independent as possible. They won't be working for the pharmaceutical industry um, and they will be independent of, um, of the company. All of these uh, results will then be used um, and the results of the trials, like all scientific, scientific research, will be published in uh, journals that have been scrutinised in a process called peer review. So peer review journals means that other scientists can check on the results and therefore um, it can actually, it's, it's a piece of scientific information that everyone can look at and they can look at the claims that people are making. Also you have national bodies such as NICE which is the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence uh, look at the published results of drug trials and they decide which drugs give good value for money 
and should be prescribed by the NHS. This next section is just for GCSE biology higher tier. So it's all about monoclonal antibodies. The, these are produced from a single clone of a cell. So each type is specific to one binding site on a specific protein antigen. So they can target specific cells in the body or specific chemicals. The way that they are made in the laboratory is that they use mice and they uh, take uh, white blood cells called lymphocytes that make specific antibodies but do not divide. They then fuse these with what we call tumour cells and these don't make antibodies but since they're tumour cells, cancer cells, they can therefore divide and they combine it to make, make what we call a hybridoma cell. And the cells then are cloned, and then when they're cloned, you can produce a specific monoclonal antibody that you can separate and purify, and this can be used as a treatment. Consequently, if you're producing one type of antibody, this can be really, really useful in uh, many applications. So I'm going to briefly go through the main applications of, the mo of using monoclonal antibodies. The first use is in pregnancy tests. So these rely on uh, monoclonal antibodies that actually trap or bind to the hormone human HCG. So HCG, which is known as the human chorionic gonadotropin, but you'll just need to know it as HCG. So what, ha what happens is that um, it, when you urinate on the test strip there, Okay, the urine passes through, okay, and there is a fixed antibody there, that's the monoclonal antibody there, um, that traps the HCG. And basically it then um, is attached to a dye, and if HCG is trapped, then that dye will release the, um, will determine if you're pregnant, basically. So a colour change signifies that uh, sig signals that it is a positive result. Current research is looking at the use of monoclonal antibodies to treat cancer. So these monoclonal antibodies can uh, find the cancer cells, specific cancer cells, and they and what might be a, um, they can do, what they could do is signal or track to other cells of the immune system. But also you can attach certain chemicals that you want to kill the cancer cell. Scientists are also using them for um, research, so locating or identifying specific molecules in a cell or a tissue. So they produce the antibody and link it to a molecule um, of a fluorescent dye. So when the monoclonal antibody binds to the desired molecules, scientists can see what has happened by observing this buildup of fluorescence, as you can see in this diagram here. Other uses, uh, you could use it for monitoring, measuring and monitoring uh, levels of hormones and other chemicals in the blood, um, and also screening for blood for HIV infection or detecting drugs that have been used illegally. Uh, for example, the saliva test uh, used for, uh, to, for, by the police to see if someone has been dr uh, drug driving. Again, this next section is for GCSE biology only, so it's related to plant diseases. Uh, so you need to be able to recognise that disease in plants usually uh, has these kind of symptoms. All right, so you can see things like patches, abnormal growth, leaf discoloration. And why is that a problem? Well, that is a problem because it affects photosynthesis. You will need to know about... Um, three different types of plant diseases in a great bit of detail. First one is tobacco mosaic virus caused by a virus. It doesn't always um, affect tobacco plants though. Rose black spot, which is a wee rose black spot, which is that one, which is a fungal disease, and then the effects of aphids. Now aphids are small insects that feed directly into the phloem of the plant. Therefore, they're taking away sugars and also they can spread viral diseases. You'll also need to know about ions, so particular, particular ions and nitrates. 
and magnesium. And you'll need to learn what they do in terms of the deficiencies they cause and what effect it has on the plants. And finally, again, this is in GCSE Biology, you'll be able to describe physical and chemical plant defence responses. Now, um, I'm not going to go through these, but um, a lot of this is kind of, I would say, is, is common sense. All right, More than likely, they would give you some information. But just be aware of the things that they're saying here. But more than likely, they will give you an example in the um, exam and they'll expect you to talk about the physical defences or the chemical or the mechanical adaptations. So it's really looking at the clues that they give you in the uh, exam question. OK, a uh, bit longer than I was expecting actually this section. It's quite a large section, particularly if you're doing GCSE biology. Slightly less to learn if you're doing combined science. hope you found that useful. Um, please do check out my other Paper 1 revision videos. My next video I'm going to do is related to bioenergetics. So I will see you soon and please do subscribe to Dr Biology if you haven't already. In fact, please tell your friends.